Welcome to Empower You, everyone. I am Dan Regenold. So this may be our last class of our 19th semester, but we just invite you to these, these sessions. We hope that you're gonna get educated, enjoy life a little bit, and get engaged in super important topics like we're gonna talk about, like the budget of the state of Ohio, and, and tough financial questions and matters for people that are impacted. For those of you who are new tonight to Empower You, we wanna welcome you, and we hope you'll join us for many classes. You can always find our schedule at empoweruohio.org. Gosh, I've kind of got used to these virtual sessions. I think it's been seven since we've been bunkered down on Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Your interest in the classes, your attendance has been incredible. But I am longing for the day when we can get back to our Empower You studio and um, get back to where we will hopefully get together to see our team that I want to just uh, introduce to you quickly. Um, and that team is Betty Overstreet, who's our executive director, Jill Google, who is our operations director, Bill Roll, who's our treasurer, and Jay Grunke, our incredible producer. I've also, once again, I've got uh, my bag of Cousin Willie's popcorn, since we don't have any fresh popcorn here. Hopefully that'll help me get through the evening tonight. So. Tonight, as I said, it might be our last class of our 19th semester, and I just really uh, want to tell you that it has really been a high honor to learn with you and get empowered with you this semester, and on top of that, it's been fun. So let's start off with tonight's giveaway. Uh, first, I want to say congrats to Jerry A. Jerry A. won the George Orwell. We had kind of a George Orwell night the other night, 1984 book. Congrats to you, Jerry. Tonight's giveaway is from one of the, the true greats, somebody I grew up with. I don't know how many of you have read the great Zig Ziglar. Gosh, as we start to get into the summer uh, months, we'll have a lot of time to reflect. I hope we'll be outside a lot, but uh, Zig has written a, a great book on goals, how to get the most out of your life. If you'd like your chance to win the book tonight, just take your mouse to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a button that says Q and A and uh, just drop me your email address. It's totally random. And if you are chosen, you'll get the Zig Ziglar book, which will be a, a fun read. And that's also where you ask questions tonight. And I know both of our guests, Greg Lawson and John Deaver, want your questions. So as they're talking, if you have anything that's on your mind, uh, just jot them a note and I'll see it and I'll ask them. I want to reflect on Tuesday's class for just a minute. I thought it was an important class. And Tom Z from up north really focused me on the importance of trying to stay positive in this pandemic. And, and mostly when I say positive, I mean uh, how, I, how we communicate with people like uh, employees, like uh, friends about um, some of the, what I'll say are inaccurate statistics or poorly framed statistics that you may be seeing on some of the shows you're watching. I know it's confusing. I know you hear a lot of different things, but I just would once again lead you. If you really want to get your statistics down, I really recommend you listen to Ben Shapiro's podcast of April 19th when he had Scott Gottlieb on, the former uh, uh, director of the FDA. The statistics on there were really, really put things in perspective on where we're at with the pandemic. And, and I suggest you go there. Um, with respect to tonight's reading, you know, I always like to hand out an article. Um, usually I print it off for you, but I can't do that tonight. But this is a great one that's out in the Wall Street Journal tonight. I don't know if Greg Lawson will have any thoughts about this, but the article's called Bail Out the States? Question mark, question mark. I don't know how many of you heard uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, his response to the question about bailing out the states yesterday. And his response was, a kind of a brutal one. Uh, maybe we should just let them consider uh, declaring bankruptcy. Um, but you can read this article at empoweruohio.org under tonight's class. It's interesting. So a little bit of an editorial real quick. Sorry, but um, this is from the owner of a small business in Hamilton County that I, I saw this posting today. And I just ask you over the summer when I'm not having the chance to see you that you remember these small business owners uh, really, they're the rock on which so much is built. It's, and, and, and as one, I'm just going to tell you, it's brutal out there. All the decisions, thoughts that you're having to make, really just about things you never dreamed you'd have to, have to make. But this is what that, uh, that owner, that business owner wrote today. Dear State of Ohio, 
The only thing more fun than you forcing me to lay off my workforce due to your uh, executive order is getting a six page form to fill out for every employee that is now on unemployment. Thanks so much for simplifying the form to six pages. That makes total sense since uh, I don't know, there's about a million laid off workers in the state, that's out of 11 million. So your state workers now have at least 6 million pages to go through. Good job, well thought out, really. This is one of the joys of doing business, thanks. That's kind of how a lot of business owners are feeling right now, they're under siege. One uh, long-term kind of Empower You attendee wrote me today and said, is it true the virus is no more deadly than the flu? Uh, I once again direct you to Ben Shapiro for that, but she said, I'm not sure what to believe, but as a lawyer, I was taught early on that often the truth lies somewhere in the middle. I'm sure our attendee is wise and correct, and I'm only hoping that there's a real balance between Dr. Amy, the governor, and uh, the business and our economy. So uh, how about for future classes? Um, tonight might be our last class, but we are working on a few things. Uh, one of the things we're working on, da 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 is how to cut hair with your host, Governor Mike DeWine and Dr. Amy. We're hopeful about this class. I've called them many times and they've told me, Dan, it's tied up in scheduling. Other than that, watch the website. Hopefully we'll have another class or two if anything pops up. So I'm remembering Empower You Studio. This is what it looks like for those of you who have been there. And uh, we're excited because in the fall, we'll be entering our 20th semester of teaching free classes. And our semester will start on September 22nd, uh, 2020. And that'll be fun. And I'll look forward to hopefully seeing you all there. The one class I'm so sorry we, could, we aren't gonna be able to present is Sheriff Richard K. Jones, uh, who was gonna speak at our year end um, class at Empower You, and we're just not gonna be able to have that because it's just a week or so from now. And, and uh, Sheriff Jones, I was excited to hear him talk because we had two of the sheriff candidates from Hamilton County in to pre present their vision of justice and um, law enforcement. And I really wanted you to see the difference between how Sheriff Jones looks at the world and, and, and how, how maybe they did, but we'll have to do that at another time. With that in mind, let me introduce you to our first guest tonight, Greg Lawson. Greg Lawson is a research fellow at the Buckeye Institute. In this role, Greg works with all members of the Buckeye research team with a particular focus on local government and education issues. He's also Buckeye's main liaison to the State House, where he educates policymakers in both the legislative and executive branches on free market solutions to Ohio's challenges. Prior to his position at Buckeye, Greg served in the Ohio General Assembly as a Legislative Service Commission Fellow. He then went on to several government affairs roles focusing on numerous policy topics, including Medicaid, school choice, transportation funding, and Ohio's building code. He also has a background in PAC fundraising, grassroots organizing, and communications, and he served for five years on the boards of two Columbus-based schools. Greg Lawson, welcome tonight to Empower You. Thank you very much. And as I started, great. Um, really want to say thank you very much to Dan in particular. Uh, it's a genuine pleasure to be able to participate uh, in this. I've, I've really enjoyed Empower You. Uh, I've done it quite a few for Buckeye. I think I've done uh, uh, at least uh, a couple for uh, uh, on some other issues that I have some interest sets in. And it, it's just great. And uh, I love your facility. I love what you've done with that place. I can't wait till you can get it open again and have people come come back there. And I think that's one of the great challenges. It's also really good to have uh, Jonathan Deaver there, kind of on the on the backside of, of, of my my area, because uh, Jonathan, whip smart guy, love talking with him. It's uh, a great pleasure there, and he always brings uh, an A game to everything that he he does. So you're in for a real treat uh, when he when he goes as well. Uh, you know, the Buckeye Institute is most of the folks here uh, I think know. Uh, we're the free market think tank here in Ohio. We believe that the, le the least amount of government intrusion in people's lives is the right thing to do. There are certain things government's supposed to do, of course, to, to provide for public safety uh, and contract uh, enforcement, things like that, to make sure that we can run things. But really, it's
Well, we seem to have lost Greg Lawson. Hopefully he'll be back on in a minute and uh, these technical challenges do come up. So we will ask uh, if, if uh, we'll give Greg just a second more to log back, see if he can log back in. And if he can't, we'll see if uh, our other guest, John Deaver, might be uh, ready to go. Mr. Deaver, are you there? I am. Good, good, good. Let me introduce you. We'll get Greg back on at, at, the, uh, at the tail end. And sorry about that little bit of a technical snafu for everybody. But John will go first tonight. We'll switch up our order. John is just a very talented attorney and somebody who's been great to partner with, uh, like with the Prince in, in his incredible relationship with the Princeton School District, which I know is they very much valued. But he's got over 20 years of experience as a litigator and an entre entrepreneur and a legislator. And John rose to prominence in the state of Ohio as a representative from the Southwest Ohio District 28. He brings a breadth of knowledge as a respected attorney, handling a vast array of matters from debt restructuring to real estate issues to uniform commercial code to representing various interests in negotiation and advocacy. And John, we just welcome you tonight to empower you. It's great to Thanks, have you. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. I wish I were actually physically there. It'd been a nice change of pace, but uh, I guess in this day and age, this will have to work for now. Yeah. So um, thanks for having me on. I uh, wanted to talk briefly um, for about 15 minutes to take questions. And um, hopefully you like my coronavirus beard. So this is 42 days of beard growth. Um, so I can't grow it up here, but I got the face. So now, now if uh, I do get Dr. Amy and um, if I do get Dr. Amy and the governor to teach the hair cutting class, I'll also ask if, if they've got any tips on beard manicuring too. Well, that would be great. I'm just going to let it do Duck Dynasty. That's that's what I my kids like it. So I figure I'll just let it go and we'll, we'll check in with you once out. a semester. We'll check in with you once a <laughs> semester or so and see how you're doing. Okay. Yeah, it's great. So I wanted to kind of give people a good overview because there's so much confusion going on right now. And a lot of folks, especially small business owners, are panic stricken because this is the first time ever that we've ever seen a government say you can't operate. And it's different. We normally we've seen crashes in economic cycles in the past. When I first started practicing law, it was right after 9-11. And I think everybody that's, you know, anywhere between 30 and older remembers exactly where they were when that occurred. And I remember the day that happened and I got sworn in shortly thereafter and I was dealing with the economic consequences of the financial burden that that put on the American economy. And just a few years later, we had the, the big crash, the real estate bubble, and it affect hundreds of thousands of people and millions of Americans losing value in their home, losing their 401ks. It was, a, it was an interesting time academic, from an academic perspective, but also from a financial perspective. But one, one thing that was true then is even if you were lost your job during that period of time or your house got into foreclosure, there was another way to make a living and it was, there was something else out there. There was other opportunities. And so right now it's a little scary because, you know, businesses like my wife's were shut down. Um, it's been about 40 days since she's been shut down. She's not allowed to see her patients. Uh, there are other doctors that are that way. The uh, small restaurants are, are facing a really huge decision that they've got to make to shut her permanently or try to find a way to navigate forward. So we've got a lot of unknowns. And when there are unknowns, people get scared and rightfully so. But what I wanted to do tonight was empower individuals since you've got something called empower you, right? So I wanna empower every single one of you to understand some basics. And Dan, what I'm also offering to anybody that's listening, I'm gonna give every single person a half an hour of my time. All they have to do is go to my website, deverlaw.com, and you can put that up for them if you like. There's a scheduling function on there. They can get a half an hour of my time to go through their personal information confidentially. Uh, we're doing that right now as a service to people. I don't charge them for helping them to kind of figure out what to do. And I'm not charging them to do small business uh, work either. I want people to be successful. Um, so right now I, I wanted to make sure that people knew up front that we're offering that. I'll put, um, your I'll put your information on the website tomorrow, John. Thank you. Yes, sir. So there's a couple of things that I can tell people that they need to do right now. So when I knew that we were being shut down as a business, the first thing you have to do is take a detailed inventory of your spending. Most people really don't know to the penny where their money goes, uh, that whether it's a credit card, that they get auto payments on there, whether it's a PayPal where they have an auto payment, uh, subscriptions, Netflix, uh, video streaming services, uh, online magazines, all of those things bleed you slowly if you don't have an income. So if you're a business, 
you need to really start thinking about that. Or even if you're a household affected by a layoff, you need to start looking at your personal monthly budget. And the best way to do that is to go back and do a deep dive on all your finances, your credit card statements, your bank statements, and create a household budget. And in that budget, um, and we can provide, we'll provide some free forms for people for you too, Dan. In that budget, it does a couple of things. One, it shows your income and it also shows your expenses and it shows your assets and your liabilities. So you know down to the penny where everything's going and it gives you a better picture of how to manage the resources that you have or don't have. That's the what first thing to do. What, ha what happens if you've only got expenses? Well, that's a big problem. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that do right now, right? Mm -hmm. And having expenses only means you have to start really looking at a couple, the, the next step, right? Which is some of the loss mitigation or what I, what I like to call uh, you know, non-bankruptcy workout options. And there's a bunch of them, but I wanted to highlight a couple of them because everybody thinks that when they start losing money, they have to file bankruptcy. That's the answer. Everything's got to go to bankruptcy. And I've, my experience in 20 years is that's the option of absolute last resort. When you go to bankruptcy court, there's two people that benefit from that. One is the bankruptcy trustees and two, the lawyers. If you're going into a repayment plan, you will owe exactly the same amount of money in five years that you owe today. So you get no relief, but they take a third of your income in the meantime. It goes to interest and legal fees. So you're not benefiting from it. So the best thing that you can do is do that analysis of where your finances are, how much money you've got coming in, how much going out, and stop the bleeding where you can. But then you got to start thinking about, okay, how do I start working through this? So there's a couple of things that are right off the top of the bat. Some of you are going to get sued. That's just inevitable. The banks right now are offering forbearance agreements. Now, what a forbearance agreement is, it's an agreement between you as a borrower and the lender that will reinstate you later after a lump sum is paid. So most banks right now, even the federals are saying, we're going to give you 90 days where you don't need to pay your bills. But at the end of 90 days, all the principal, all the interest, all the escrows that you would normally pay are due in 90 days. Now, remember your note on your mortgage says in 90 days, if you don't pay it, it's in default and they can sue you. So if you don't have all that money for the last 90 days ready to go, you're gonna be in a foreclosure situation. So forbearance is okay if you have the ability to make that work. So on the, but most folks can, if you can't pay your bills today and you have no income for 90 days, how are you gonna pay your bills in 90 days? Especially right. when you owe all 90 days worth of it. So normally when that, hap when that happens, you enter into a true loss mitigation of moment, right? Where most people feel that they have to file bankruptcy, but there's a lot of options. You don't have to do that. The, the first is, of course, if they sue you, you could litigate your case. I guarantee you, I've been doing this for a long time, that the vast majority of lenders have made a mistake when it comes to the servicing or the securitization of your loan, and it will provide you an opportunity to defend and reorganize your debt, and they will be forced to work with you. Those are the lenders that don't want to. Most lenders will work with you on a modification, and what a modification is, is a fundamental restructuring of your loan. So from the bottom up, you're renegotiating your terms, your interest rate, and your payment, and also how the escrow agreements work. Um, question, I, on, question on that, John. Yes, sir. So that's interesting. So let's say you do that. Now, are they going to ask you to kind of go through that whole application process and take an appraisal, or are they, is it something now they're just going to do for you? Now, most of the time in the past, so let's take the 2008 cycle as an example, the loss mitigation uh, process is one department. So within that, you would have, uh, you know, your short sale processes, your, your loan modifications, your forbearance, your deferment, all of those processes would work the same way. You would have to provide certain documentation at a specific time and place it in. And I, I've got some horror stories on how bad that got, and we should expect that that will happen again. But you know, what, you, what they're looking at is uh, basic, your ability to pay. So they're looking for W-2s, your bank statements, the traditional things that you would need for underwriting to validate, and then they'll send you a package. And normally there's a standardized form where they request information. Now, the problem though, is that those, those documents that you send them are only valid for about 30 days under traditional loss mit. So if you get to the 30th day, they ask for all new documents and you have to start it all over again. And they're very, very particular about the order they receive it, the form and function of your budget, because you'll have to prepare a budget for them, and the, the fields have to be lined up in a certain way. We had one fellow a few years back uh, in, the, in the crisis, and we couldn't figure out why he wasn't being approved. We ran him through a real estate mortgage analysis. We looked at his, at his balance sheet. We, looked, we did everything for him, and he came in as a customer, and we said, I don't know why it's not being approved, so let's submit it for you. So we submitted, and it was approved instantaneously. 
And what we found out is literally, Dan, the color Sharpie, the highlighter color, the yellow color was the wrong hex code. So in our computer system, we put the right hex code of the color that they wanted in the box. He was using a Sharpie from Staples to highlight it. So when it went into their system, it rejected the entire application, right? So simple things like that, when these things get bogged down, can create problems for people. So what we try to do at our firm is guide people through those simple things and help them out. Uh, but there's a few more things that people can do. Obviously, like right now, if you have the means and the ability to, consider refinancing. I, I, list, I learned today that the National Mortgage Bankers Association is indicating they believe 30-year mortgage rates could go down to as low as 1.5%. So hear, hear me out, 1.5%. Right now they're three, but it could be 1.5%. So that's a 50% savings on the interest that you would theoretically be paying. If that happens, there's a, we could do a whole segment on the economic consequences of what that means, but refinancing is an option, of course. Deferment, uh, there are certain things that you can defer, such as student loans. Right now the federal government is offering interest-free deferment on your student loans. So if you have student loans and you are short cash right now, that's something that you can do without penalty. So they're not going to compound the interest on you for the next six months. So get in and, and take care of that if you can. Um, there's also you get, you get a you get a, you can get a six month. Deferment. You can you can okay. that's right right now. So there is an opportunity for that right now. So that's something that you should explore if you're short on cash. The other thing too that I'm advising families to do that have a lot of equity. Right now, people with means are buying up houses and they're paying full retail. So if you've got a house where you have more than 50% loan to value, now might be a good time or in a month or two when those interest rates go to 1.5, you're gonna be able to get more money for your house based on payment. There's gonna be more opportunities to buy a house later because this market is going to go back down. We're gonna see opportunities to buy back in. So if you know that you can't make your house payment, but you've got a lot of equity, you may want to consider getting your, ready, your house ready for sale. There's also something called a short sale. If you're upside down and you have to get out, uh, that's negotiating with your lender to sell your house for less than what you owe. And of course, at the very end, the bankruptcy is always, always an option of last resort. I would never advocate anybody to go down that path. You always end up in a better situation if you actually go through a normal legal process in state court. Uh, they have to work with you there. In bankruptcy court, they don't. There's strict rules and they win. If you go to court, you can actually work with them and cut a deal and, and end up in a better situation. A bankruptcy ruins your credit for seven to 10 years. If you have a foreclosure filing or you have lawsuits, within 18 months to 24 months, you can get your credit score back up over a 720. Gotcha. Well, just real quick, I wanted to let everybody know, due to the live, uh, the excitement of live TV, we, <laughs> we did, uh, Greg is with us. He'll be back on. We're going to have Greg on at the end of John's segment. So, John, so what... If somebody has like, let's say a, a problem with a credit card debt or sure. something like that, are you recommending that they just get on the phone and call these people and try to deal with them or what? what Absolutely. I mean, there's, you, there's nothing to lose by calling your credit card and asking for a reduced interest rate or even right now, some credit card companies are allowing individuals to skip a payment or two without penalty. So there are, they are working with folks through this. So within the, you know, I, I would encourage anyone to do that anyway, a credit card companies will always work with you on interest rate, even in good times. So it's always something to consider. Now, if you get on the phone and you, you have to call one of those people, what, who do you try to, who would you try to talk to? What department? Uh, well, honestly, you're going to call the 800 number and then you're just going to ask for somebody on the phone and they're going to take you to the right place. Normally they're the right individual. Now, if it gets delinquent and you start and you get those notices in the mail that they're going to sue you, then I would advise talking to somebody who has experience in reorganizing and restructuring debt. Um, there are debt consolidation companies out there, but I would seek some legal advice before going down that path. Gotcha. So what you're saying is it, it can be a pretty complex minefield, but, but it can. Uh, somebody like well, and there's, there's consumer protections that we have, right? Uh -huh. State law and federal law. And so knowing whether or not there's a violation is also helpful when negotiating some of these things, um, because if they've made some mistakes, they're going to work with you on principle and interest as well. Right, right. Uh, anything else we need to think about? And, and then I, I wanted to maybe move into a couple different areas. Uh, fire away, Dan. Well, I'm just curious, John. Um, I've been kind of, you know, I've, I've had my, my, my head's been around this whole, whole thing about the pandemic for a while. And I'm just wondering, what, where was the Ohio legislature in this whole thing between the governor and Dr. Act? And I, in looking at the Ohio Constitution, it's the legislature that has the emergency powers, not the governor, not 
not Dr. Acton. And with you being so involved with the legislature when you were at District 28, why, why aren't we hearing anything from our legislature? That's a really good question. And I think it uh, demands an answer, quite frankly. Um, th there are, the way we've been handling this is not, I wouldn't have handled it the way it's been handled personally. I mean, if I were the governor as an example, um, I believe in a lead by example approach. I went to military school and that was our credo, lead by example. And then what that means is that if you're asking someone to sacrifice, you sacrifice first. If you're asking someone to charge a hill with a bayonet, if you're the, if you're the platoon leader or you're the captain, you're the lieutenant, you take your rifle with your bayonet and you run up the hill first and lead the charge and, and then your men follow instead of taking a different approach. So I think if we look back at this, there's gonna be a lot of information that we'll, we'll, we'll obtain later, but you're right. I mean, constitution, state constitution, the legislature does have a lot of influence and power. I think that this is a unique situation. Nobody knew what we were getting ourselves into at the beginning. Um, my, my issue of always, as you know, Dan, I'm an, I'm an economics guy. I care about debt and money and finance and small business and keeping people working and making sure people can make ends meet and making sure the disability community has the services that they need and the senior services are taken care of. And the only way those things happen is if our economy is moving. And so my criticism initially was that there, was, that there didn't seem to be an economic plan and there there may be a way if that to balance all of these interests. I think there really is. There's a, there's a way to balance these things. I don't know, I'm not in the legislature, so I'm not in those caucus rooms now. I'm not having those conversations with the speaker and the leaders, but it seems to me that there's more that the legislature should be doing and could be doing to find a way to balance these things. I mean, I'll give you a quick example. Um, when you, if you look at J.P. Morgan Chase, they published a really interesting document recently and it, and it showed the financial livelihood of all the different types of businesses and industries and this is something i've been saying since they initially decided they were going to shut down the schools is that most of these industries they can stay open for a certain period of time without revenue i mean you're a business owner dan you know how many months or weeks of income you have in your bank account and you keep that in there based on your cushion knowing that in your worst month you know it might be down 20 percent or 30 percent because it's an average over all the years you've done business so you know that even when it's bad, you know how much you need in reserves to kind of balance the equation, right? Right. But, what you, but no one ever expected the government to say, you're not allowed to bring in any revenue, any kind whatsoever, shut down completely, right? And so when you do that, you're actually taking something from a person and it's your property. And we have, a four, we have the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which mandates that there's a, take, there's a takings clause that we're, we're entitled to just compensation. And then the 14th Amendment applied it to the states and the local governments. So we're in uncharted territory for a lot of different reasons. We've never had a response like this, a global response to a pandemic like this. In the past, we've had pandemics that were, that uh, were, you know, they went through waves throughout the world and governments just kind of dealt with them and it was just part of being alive. This is a different response and the implications are deeper, broader and wider. We live in a country by that's designed with a rule of law, with a constitution and statutes, and our rights are ours. And we voluntarily give them to the government to do certain things on our behalf. And the question I always have in situations like this is how far are we allowing the government to usurp and take over those responsibilities that are ours by nature and ours by right and voluntarily turning those over? And what does that mean long-term? Um, we can all we can all pontificate on that, but it's a delicate balance. And what we have to hope for is that our leaders understand that, and that they're looking out for the balance there, right? I, that there's a time and a place for for restoring that, and hopefully it's coming soon. I had an opportunity to be on a conference call with uh, Lieutenant Governor John Husted today. He was he was talking to NFIB, National Federation of Independent Business Owners, and uh, Governor Dewine has these really two quality uh, people that work for him. He's got uh, Dr. Acton on one hand and he's got John Houston on the other kind of uh, who's hoping to get the economy restarted. I would just hope that the governor would start uh, having a more balanced outlook on both of them because it just doesn't seem like he is right now at all. Um, now, just for instance, uh, your wife, who I know is a, a, a dentist up in yes. uh, uh, just north of Sher Sheridan. What's the official uh, city she's she's in, John? Well, it's it's uh, Old Pisgah, so it's technically oh. Westchester, right? But right, it's just right, right the, across the highway, right by right by the baseball field. So that's what, right. 
what what's your vision on on you you've been thinking about this what would your vision be on when you would tell somebody to think about reopening their business well i think the reality of it is that there there are lots of different businesses and this whole argument over what's essential and isn't essential is an, is a debate unto itself and we could probably spend 3 or 4 hours talking about who has the right to decide what's essential because essential to one person who can't make a living and can't put food on the table his job is essential right that's essential to their family and when you're you know so going back to what i was saying with jp morgan chase they have this chart that shows based on industry how much reserves are based on the industry typically right and professionals meaning folks like my wife or doctors they have about 35 40 days roughly right and it's and then there are very few businesses that are longer than it they're about on the on the far end right everybody else is less than that Sure. With zero revenue, right? Now, as a lawyer, I'm about that. Let me be a little bit more. But right now, very little revenue because people are not spending money and I'm not taking people's money either because I want to help people right now. There's going to be a time when people will need me. and But right now, I want to make sure that they have the tools that they need to not need me, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, but there, there is a, there's a, a scale there. And so, but, you know, you've got these folks here. We're at day 42, okay? And we've got some businesses that have been shuttered for 40 days, some for uh, 30, some for a little bit long in between. The, a lot of these folks are week to week. 80% of the world's population is paycheck to paycheck. Now, we have three different cycles on pay, weekly, bi-monthly, bi right? And monthly, essentially. So we are already seeing the week to week people haven't been able to eat or uh, get to work or pay their rent at all for four weeks now. The biweekly people, they're in their third week with no compensation. The monthly people are now into either a full month of non-compensation or they're getting ready to go into one without any compensation, right? And so as the snowballs, then what, if, what happens is that those people can't buy things, which means now we're seeing the second wave, right? I mean, you notice a lot of people in the media are being furloughed because there's no ad revenue at the news sources, right? So now they're seeing it and they're feeling it. So it, this is the thing, it's, it, you know, initially it's like you drop a pebble in the ocean and it's just a small little wave and it just kind of does this thing. What we've done though, is we've taken a massive asteroid boulder and plunged it into the middle of the abyss. It's and the worst, as, case of, worst case of dominoes. It, and as the water gets closer and closer and the water gets shallower and shallower, the waves rise and they crash onto the shore. And, the, and what we've got to do is find a way to arrest to that because if we don't, the economic consequences are going to be catastrophic. We're not going to see 20, 30% unemployment. We're going to be higher than that. We'll be 30, we'll be 40, maybe even 45. So I've got a question from Cindy. Uh, I wanted sure. to ask you, it says, I received this code. I'm assuming that that means Dr. Acton's code from the office of the House of Representatives. But ultimately, I've been told the only person, persons who can rescind the stay at home order are the governor and the Department of Health. I guess Cindy's saying that they trump the Ohio legislature. Is that your understanding? Well, there's a statute that gives her the authority to do what she does. The Ohio legislature has the ultimate authority and they can get back and, and make changes to state law. Um, and they can do over, veto overrides as well. So if they stick together, they can pass a piece of legislation to override that. So let me go back to that, uh, or that question. I, that, that I, I put you in a tough position asking you about your wife's business. Let's say you own something like a, something like a, um, let's just say like a, a card store or something like that. Would, uh, would you recommend people try to reopen as soon as they can? Or, or, or what do you think? I personally think that if, if you can get your business back open to the extent that, that you can do so, I mean, it makes sense. But here's the other part of this too. You got to realize that we are in a game-changing moment, okay? I mean, that nothing like this has ever happened before. And what, you, what we're going to learn from this is one of two things. We're either going to learn how to be better, smarter, and, and wiser at our financial decisions and how we do business, or we're going to let it kill us. And those are the only two choices you have. So I have always told people that it, during this period of time, you have this time to get smarter, wiser, fi you know, financially savvy, um, figure out a new and creative and better way to do your business. I mean, the, if you look at what Amazon's doing, if we're not careful, Amazon will be the last, the only business left, right? They're, they're, gonna, they're approaching $3,000 a share and have doubled inside of a month because they're the go-to person to provide basic products and services to houses, right? 
So it, right now is the ultimate opportunity if you're an entrepreneur, right? So you may have a business. So the way I look at it is if, yeah, if you've got a card shop, find a way to sell it right now in a different new way and provide value now, right? Because those brick and mortars may not be where people go anymore. I mean, think about my, like my parents are in their 70s, mid 70s. Never in a million years could I have gotten them to use Zoom. Never, right? Now they're using it every day to talk to their grandkids. That's cool. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed how many people have continued to order picture frames at, at frameusa.com and how many more people have been doing it. People are spending money, but the people that have brick and mortar just say they have no business whatsoever. That's right. Um, so I have to ask you the, the tough question. Um, what's down the road for you? Are you going to try to get, get back into politics? And, and what, what do you, what, what, what's up your sleeve? Well, so for me, I'm working with a fintech company right now. So we've been working on a lot of monetary policy. So I've, I've been, uh, was very deep in the payroll protection program. I was working with the treasury to get that implemented with the policy up front and have, have started working with a blockchain fintech company about a year ago. And so what we have been doing is educating and converting our monetary system. Uh, so as you know, and well, most people may not know this, but Everybody thinks that when the federal government prints money, that's all the money there is, right? It gets passed around. Well, the way it really works, most people don't know this, is that money is created by banks. So the federal government, they print, say, $10, and it costs them six cents to make the, the, the 10 spot. Um, so they give a dollar ninety-four to the bank, and then the bank will go out and they make loans. Well, when they make loans, that's how they make money. They create two things, a debit and a credit in their system. So the credit, which is the asset column, shows the mortgage in the note with the interest rate and the liability then is the electronic indicator of how much money they're kicking out to say you or I as a mortgage. But they really never made, they didn't, they just created the money out of thin air. They don't have actual real dollar bills that they're giving you or me, or you're not giving dollar bills to the homeowner, right? You're giving them a, a digital representation of a dollar. And so as they do that, they generate 97% of the money that's in the system. So what we have is a debt system. So our money is created by debt. That's why the federal government is creating more debt because it's the only way to generate money. And if you can't generate money, then you have no liquidity, which means you can't buy groceries. You can't, uh, you know, businesses can't operate because we, we operate sure doing, on debt. We, we are sure doing a good job of that, aren't we? We are indeed. Wow. Now, now, the interesting part about all of that, though, is that if you shift to a pre-1971 gold standard, you don't have that kind of economy anymore. Then what you have is an asset for money economy. And what that essentially means is that if I have $10 and you needed it, Dan, then I could loan it to you and you would pay me back $10 and 50 cents, right? And then now we actually are creating real money because I had a real asset instead so, of manufacturing so it. Let me, let, so let me, let, me, let me make sure I'm understanding right. You don't have any announcement to make to to us tonight about anything. oh absolutely not no I mean I I'll tell you I love policy as you know uh -huh. and and I'm and I'm always working with our elected officials to come up with better ideas and better ways of doing things but right now no I'm I'm enjoying um, the the uh, the environment that I'm in currently um, I will never say no though I I do enjoy it and we accomplished a lot you you helped me accomplish a lot of things in Columbus and uh, the constituents of the district were wonderful to me and we did great things for Princeton and the people um, you work, the people you worked with, loved working with you, John. I will say thank that. You. I just want to be perfectly clear to everybody listening tonight what John has said that uh, I'm going to put John's um, business information up on the website tomorrow, empoweryouohio.org. If you or somebody you know is in some kind of financial duress and you don't know what the best way to go is, this is a guy that you can call that can help you. Did I get that right? Yes, sir. Yeah, and I, like I said, um, I'm not going to charge you for the time. I really truly want to help people right now. This is not a, uh, a normal environment, and I think people need to get the best advice they can. And you know, look, I charge three fifty an hour, so you got to figure you're getting yourself a pretty good deal there for a half an hour for the the kind of information you're going to get from me. But at least we can help you um, create some sense of peace in your home because there's nothing worse than being stressed out about this it's when things are uncertain. It's it's terrible, and we need to be optimistic from the standpoint that. If you can get good information, knowledge is power in everything, right, Dan? So if you know what to do, you're empowered. Of course, that's the whole premise of your, your uh, organization there. You're empowered to make good decisions for your family, for yourself, and for your neighbors. 
And that allows you to also be generous. If you have your universe under control, you can help the person standing next to you, which is really what we're going to need to do in the weeks and months to come. John Deaver, thank you so much for visiting tonight with Empower. Always. Good night. Always. Good night. Thank you. Greg Lawson, come on down. Are you with us tonight? Back? I am. Back? And All right. the video back up. Hopefully everybody can hear me. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, I think it was on my end. My Wi-Fi apparently cut out on me. It took me like five minutes to figure out what was going on. You're good. We're glad to have you back. Well, thank you. And it gave me a chance to listen a little bit to Jonathan there. And I certainly appreciate it. And I, he didn't disappoint me. He did a great job. Uh, I knew he would. And, you know, I will echo that this is not, these are not normal times. These are very difficult times and everybody is wrestling with this. Uh, you know, me, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm down here in my, my basement, which is pretty soundproof because it, it, it's, it's a, well, it's a finished basement. Uh, but I hear my kids thumping around upstairs, you know, and I'm like, wow, what a different world it is. And trying to educate my kids. Um, uh, we're fortunate where, where I live that we're able to do that. That We have, you know, electronic devices and things like that, that, that allow them to be able to tap into education opportunities. But it's, it, you know, my wife's working in the office upstairs. I typically go down to the basement. I'm on the phone a lot. Um, I'm writing and doing things. Hard to stay on top of that stuff uh, with the kids to make sure that they're doing stuff. And we're lucky. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking about the, the tragedy of all the families that aren't able to be as, as fortunate as we are to, to have that. Maybe don't even have, you know, whether it's a Chromebook or laptop or some way to connect to people or get Wi-Fi. Man, this is, this is just incredibly difficult, and it's unlike anything I've ever seen, certainly in my lifetime, and I think it's uh, the same for everybody. And, and the state and local governments are, are just, this is going to be a massive impact on them. Um, I hope that we're about, to, you know, the interesting thing is uh, earlier today, the governor made it clear that he's going to have some announcements early next week about what the opening kind of process is going to look like come May 1st. Um, I'll be very curious. I think everybody is obviously waiting with bated breath to see what the, the criteria is going to be. Uh, hopefully we get away from the essential, non-essential uh, conversation. I think Jonathan touched on it. I agree, you know, a person's job is pretty darn essential to them. Their livelihood is essential to them. And to say it's not in some way is, is really bad. I mean, and, and, and it's a challenge. I think we have to think through what does it look like to be a safe environment? Um, how do businesses be safe? What is the criteria that we're going to do? I mean, the CDC has a lot of information out there. I'm assuming that the governor is going to kind of pattern some of this after that. That would, that would make sense if, if he does. Um, and then businesses are going to, you know, have to, to engage in that. You know, how many customers can you have in? What's the, the shape of your uh, you have to modify some of uh, the arrangements within your, your whatever type of business it is, a restaurant. You have to deal with where tables are located, where aisles are located. I mean, there's a lot that's going to have to happen, but we need some clear criteria so businesses can get out doing it and they can be ready to open and ready to open safely. Because, you know, the, the challenge of this is not just flipping the switch from the government policy. It's now making sure that we have people out there, just regular everyday Ohioans, ready to go back, both as employees and as customers for uh, services and certainly to stores, to restaurants, to theaters, to whatever it is that we, we want. Uh, there's so much fear, I think, that's out there right now. Um, and, you know, we kind of worry a lot. I mean, what are the real numbers of co the coronavirus? And we're constantly getting new numbers every day that seems to indicate a lot more people have probably been exposed than we initially thought. So perhaps the it's as bad as it is, it may not be quite as bad as, as it's been portrayed as, and we'll see if those numbers continue to happen. But at the end of the day, people are still scared. And if they're scared, they're not going to go out and that's going to create problems for the economic engine. Uh, and so we need to have those criteria spelled out. I'm hopeful that it'll be fair criteria that is equally applicable to all businesses though, so that we don't get into this, this situation um, where, you know, you just call me not essential but my competitor down the street is because he sold, sells one additional product. Uh, so we'll see, uh, you know, what, what happens with that. But we do need to be, we need to start getting things open in a safe and responsible fashion uh, because the, the impact on lives, the impact on, on, on retirements, the impact on being able to pay the mortgage, everything that Jonathan was talking about 
it's just happening more and more and more. And then it's going to hit every local government. Um, cities aren't going to be able to pay for services. And in fact, Ohio is really bad off, perhaps uniquely bad off in the country because we rely on municipal income tax in Ohio, which is something many, many states, many, many cities and other states don't do that. This is something where Ohio, it's something that I've talked about a lot at the Buckeye Institute for years. Uh, national groups have talked about it. Um, the legislature has made some improvements, but, but this municipal income tax system means that now with the obviously income taxes bottoming out uh, due to the shutdowns, the cities aren't going to have the revenue and they're getting tons of their revenue from that one source. So they are kind of, it's like the, the stool leg has been knocked out from underneath them. And of course, how do they raise revenue from people who don't have jobs? How do you believe turn up? There's going to be constant cascading effects. I, I kind of like the analogy that Jonathan used about the tsunami wave uh, that's coming in. It's, you know, it gets shallower and shallower and the wave gets higher and higher as it comes to hit a shore. And we are seeing that and we're going to see that. So those economic reverberations are massive. So what we've tried to do at the Buckeye Institute is the free market think tank. Um, you know, we, candidly, we government is going to have to do more than we have historically felt comfortable with. Um, partly because, or not partly, but pretty much exclusively because in a lot of ways, this is a government induced recession. Um, whether you, whether you think it's an overreaction, you don't think it's an overreaction, there's no doubt that the government literally compelled businesses to not stay open. That uh, is, I mean, I'm not sure the last time in world history uh, something like that's ever happened. I mean, most recessions, even the Great Depression, uh, there were, you know, various bubbles or various financial things, business cycles that happened, and government policy may have made it better or made it worse, but the government policy wasn't literally necessarily the, the initial or core cause of it. This time it is. And, uh, you know, they're making people not be able to have money. As Jonathan said, that's taking. So what does that mean? What is the litigation uh, world going to look like for, for, for years after this because of that? It's, uh, again, unprecedented situation. Um, but we need to be able to get through this. So we've been trying to come up with a number of ideas on several different fronts at the Buckeye Institute. Uh, we've tried to figure out ways to bolster the healthcare uh, system uh, to, to make it ready. Of course, we were doing that early on as we weren't sure what were going to happen with the numbers of, of cases and obviously the whole notion of flattening the curve and making sure you had the right capacity in hospitals. Um, we clearly have the capacity in hospitals right now. In fact, <laughs> we have so much capacity in hospitals as being unused that hospitals are going bankrupt or risk going bankrupt because they can't do the, um, uh, the more voluntary type surgeries and things like that that are major uh, influxes of money for them. So, uh, but, but there's a number of things that we can do to, to ease burdens, to also make sure that as we start getting things going again, there's a lot of people who are out there that haven't been getting uh, the care they need for their regular chronic conditions and things like that. Uh, how many folks that are, uh, you know, have cholesterol issues or heart issues or things like that haven't seen their doctor, uh, haven't even been able to do the telehealth stuff uh, and have been waiting or, or and are, have been nervous to go out and do stuff. So what is going to happen with some of those sort of situations? How many people that maybe had an early stage cancer, haven't yet been able to go and get the testing that they need to, to, to find out what's happening with them. And by the time they maybe do, uh, you, you, you know, miss some valuable time and treatment for that. Those are the kind of things and those are the other stories that are gonna just be, uh, I think you're gonna hear about them. Uh, Cause I'm, 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 you've got to imagine that there's gonna be quite a few of those tragically that are, that are gonna happen. Uh, but we, we, want, we want to be able to ease regulatory burdens um, that Ohio has. Uh, we want to be able, a lot of this has to do with occupational licensing, making sure that various types of healthcare providers are able to act uh, completely within their training. Uh, we have some, some odd things in Ohio. Um, I mean, not just Ohio, a lot of states do this, uh, but you have things where certain nurses can't uh, act uh, uh, without having agreements with doctors for example, so there's limitations on how much nurses can do. And of course, there's things nurses can't do within the scope of practice, but to the extent that they can, do we need doctors sort of lording over them? Or can we allow uh, nurses to practice within their scope, which would expand the ability for people to be able to get access to primary care for some of the more immediate things that they might need? So we want to try to get rid of some of those things. There's legislation out there to do that. Uh, we, we've been supportive of, of having pharmacists be able to do more testing. Eventually, as the COVID tests come online, they should be able to administer the tests themselves as well. 
and to be able to do, do some limited amount of, of, of approved treatments um, uh, to expand, and not necessarily for COVID, but maybe for COVID, but also for uh, just other types of conditions so that you don't burden other doctors with things like just the flu or, 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 and things like that. So we've been supportive of that. It's all about capacity and making sure we have healthcare providers that are available. Um, we've looked a lot at what is we have to do for the state though, uh, the budget, uh, it's a disaster. Uh, we don't even know how bad it is, but when you see almost a million people now having filed the, for unemployment in the state of Ohio, uh, it goes without saying that the state's revenues have tanked, uh, the general revenues are, are, are tanking. Uh, the governor talked about cutting 20% of the state budget or asking state agencies to come back to him with, with 20% uh, reductions. The Lieutenant Governor just yesterday said that our rainy day fund is not is only enough to perhaps cover about half of the expenses for the rest of our two year budget cycle. We, uh, the end of the first fiscal year of the current budget ends at the end of June and then the new fiscal year starts on July 1st and runs through next June 30th. Um, but he's, you know, that's $2.7 billion uh, said it's less than half of what we're probably going to need. So that kind of gives you a little bit of insight as to what the cliff is in terms of the fiscal cliff for the state. Uh, they're going to have to do very dramatic reductions in spending. And the problem is uh, the increases in spending that they have to do, now a lot of it's being backstopped by the federal government with the CARES Act and the, and the money that's coming in but, and, and Medicaid money and stuff like that. But for all the money that's being backfilled there, you've got to ask yourself, uh, the health care costs are going to be massive. The, the requests of the local governments of the state to come back and give them extra assistance is going to be massive. The, 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 they're going to talk a lot about, they're going to have to cut, you know, firefighters, police, safety forces, all of that. That's inevitably coming. Um, how's the state going to do that? How's the state going to fund, you know, the prison system, right? I mean, the prison system, in, in fact, two, Pickaway and Marion County are two of the real hot zones, the hottest of the hot zones in Ohio uh, for the coronavirus right now. Uh, and not surprisingly, given the nature of those settings, of course, but you're not going to probably be able to cut too much out of the DRC budget because they're already actually got more people in the prisons than the prisons are designed for. And now you're going to have health care issues associated with that for both the inmates and for staff who's being, who are being exposed to this stuff on a regular basis. So where do you get it from? And, you know, you got K through 12 education. Uh, we added a decent amount of money into that in this budget. I think some of that's going to have to be looked at. We actually made a recommendation in one of our papers at the Buckeye Institute that, that um, uh, the governor and the legislature approved 675 extra do million, million dollars for uh, a variety of what they characterize as wraparound services, which has a lot to do with guidance counselors, folks to help out with uh, students who have perhaps unique challenges. But that's outside of like the, the, the regular funding mechanism for schools. Um, you, you, whether you think that's a good idea or not a good idea to have that extra spending in another category, I think you're going to have to ask yourself, that's new money uh, that's been appropriated. Do, are we able to afford that right now? Um, when, you know, maybe we need to afford figuring out how to get broadband to rural districts or how do we get enough Chromebooks so that if we get a second wave of coronavirus, God forbid, but if that happens in the fall and schools don't open up in the way that we hope they will, uh, or there's some weird mishmash of uh, schools being in, in the building, but also some blended learning, I and mean, the governor even used that phrase himself, if that happens, uh, are we going to spend the same amount of money on that? Or do we need to redirect some of that money to the technology side of things, maybe more so than the labor uh, side of things? I think those are tough questions and they're all gonna have to be answered, but you're gonna have to look at that um, because you gotta balance the budget. Uh, unlike the feds, um, we have to have the balanced budget and there's only so much debt that you're allowed to go into constitutionally. So um, the, we made a recommendation too that, that uh, there was a lot of new spending on water quality that the guy that's big, uh, plan that the governor was very proud of. He ran on it. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, he, it's about 172, wait, yeah, about, I think it's $172 million uh, uh, for that as well. And uh, uh, that's probably something that needs to at least be looked at as well as not being done because that's new spending. So really everything that's new spending, you got to put a halt on it. Uh, there's no capital budget. Usually we, we have already passed a capital budget at the state house. Uh, where uh, most of that goes to state agencies for building expenses and things like that. 
uh, as well as some community projects. And you'll probably remember down there last uh, last capital budget. I forget the exact amount, maybe four million or something like that went to FCS Cincinnati for the for the soccer stadium down there, which is goofy, and we criticized it pretty heavily. Um, but those budgets, that hasn't happened yet. There's probably not going to be a capital budget, and if it is, it's going to probably be a skinny one devoted to. Uh, I would think public health type infrastructure issues that might pop up. Um, so you've got all of those things that are going to be that are on the chopping block. Uh, because plus, you know, the other thing is if you're hearing from all these small businesses talking to the house, they've got a task force where the house is looking at it. And, and just today uh, they were hearing that we need small, we need loans. We need small business loans because um, most small businesses aren't able to tap into uh, what the feds have done through the CARES Act and even with this new appropriation that they just did uh, through the Small Business Administration where they backstop the banks and stuff for giving out the loans to keep people uh, attached to, to their employer. Um, that money's going to dry up real fast. It's going to be used real fast. If only a very small fraction of the small businesses is going to get it. So can you create some stopgap mechanisms through state, through state dollars to do that? Is that something you almost have to do to jumpstart the economy again? If you're going to do that, you're going to have to cut more somewhere else in the budget in order to do that, given all the constraints that I mentioned. So we've been really trying to, to look through the budget. I mean, uh, we haven't made this recommendation yet, but I think we probably are going to in the short term or the relatively near term. Uh, furloughs and, 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 and reductions to compensation for some of the state employees. I mean, um, Jonathan mentioned leading by example earlier. Uh, and nobody wants to be the ones that say we're taking uh, money away from people and, and food off the table of state employees. This isn't meant to demonize or, or be negative about it. It's just saying that's a big chunk of your expenses for the state. And if you're looking at getting to the numbers you need, given all these other things you know you have to spend on, um, you're going to have to probably look at things like that. And I think we're going to see that. Uh, so there's just so many myriad of issues that are out there. Uh, this is going to require probably the most dramatic uh, budget cuts that I've seen. And I've been kind of following state budgets now for about 20 years here in Ohio. And this is, this is going to be the worst that it's ever been uh, because uh, you got to do it fast. And because of the nature of this issue, it's not just a recession, but where you're seeing increased spending in some of the other areas, um, it, it's going to be dramatic and draconian, uh, and it has to be because it's not like they're going to raise taxes uh, on people in the middle of this situation because, again, I, I can't remember if I used this, used this phrase, but you can't believe a turnip. There's nothing there because nobody, they're not making, your people, the businesses aren't making money and you don't have people working, you're, you're, you're not going to get, you're not going to be able to get that. So we're going to be constantly talking to the legislature. The House is coming back to start doing some work uh, in May. The, the House just actually issued a memo uh, with some, some fairly extensive guidelines for how they're going to have their employees operate. And it's definitely a very different environment or will be a very different environment when they come back here on May 4th as of right now. That was announced today. Uh, but the good news about that is that they're finally going to start being able to wrestle with these issues and act. And I think the speaker has wanted to act for a while uh, on some of this stuff. And I know there was a question earlier with Jonathan about should the legislature, you know, be more engaged in some of this. And I think what you're about to see is they're going to get more engaged in this. And as they do get more engaged in this uh, and start, you know, having hearings and, and moving forward with stuff, they're going to have a budget corrections bill. And we are going to be very uh, aggressive in getting some of these budget reduction areas in there for them to do so that they can balance the book and redirect the resources that are there already to the areas that we know they need. Now I've gone on for a while, so I wanna, if there's questions, I'm, let me, I'd like to go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, that's sort of the 30,000 foot view uh, of, of where we're at. Uh, and it's, it, it's gonna be painful, it's gonna be difficult, uh, but there, there's, there's ways to save money, uh, but we have to do it. So. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't sure if we had if we had any folks that did have any questions or, or not. Thank you, thank you, Greg. Um, Dan apparently has lost his internet connection. Are you able to hear me? Okay. I hear you. Okay. 
I am on, but uh, uh oh. So, the, the, sorry about the technical difficulties, unfortunately tonight. Well, this is this is our night for difficulties between what happened with uh, your internet and then uh, looks like Dan is offline now. So, we do have a few questions, and we encourage people if you have a question for either um, Greg or Jonathan, you can move your mouse pointer to the bottom of the screen, which will reveal the Q and A button, and you type in your question and send it, and we will try to. Answer as many as we oh, can. Wow. There we go. I see some now. I, I, I picked it up here. So, oh, all right. Great. Dan, you appear to be back. Do you want to turn on your mic? and? So, sorry, everyone, but kind of had a Greg and I are on the same uh, same wavelength. <laughs> I have, I'm, in the, I'm in the middle of a storm, and uh, it's. I, I guess that's why we like the studio sometimes. But um, so I missed really everything that Greg had to say. I'm really sorry to sorry to hear that. Greg, did you cover everything that you wanted to cover? Yeah, I was actually, I literally just, just, just a minute ago was saying, uh, ready to have some folks uh, uh, ask questions if there are questions that people have and, and want to ask. And, and, and did you cover what, what do you, you know, um, what do you think's gonna, what, where, where do you think this is all gonna go three, four or five, six months from now? Any, any ideas? Or oh, uh, bad. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 there is no good. I mean, look, I don't wanna, I, 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 I wanna be careful. I think, I think that we need to be optimistic about what the long, long run is going to be, but I think that we can't kid ourselves about what the, sh the short and medium run of this is. Um, it's difficult to envision how we have what they call the V-shaped recovery. Uh, you know, where you have the deep decline, but then you have a very rapid ascent. And I think the reason that that's very difficult to envision that is even as you start to open up businesses, whether you do it, which I hope we don't do it this way, uh, but if we open it industry by industry, which again, I'm, I'm fearful that that might be part of how the plan um, is unveiled next week, but we'll see. Um, but even if you do it more like what I think and what we think is better, which is set some standards for if you meet these standards for the distancing, the mass, the, the various sanitation type requirements, you open. If you don't meet them, you don't open. Or if you don't meet them, we shut you down because you're not being standard. But we're not shutting you down because you're non-essential. Um, Greg, you know, I had the most incredible thing happen with a health commissioner in Springdale where I'm at. You've been to our building. And uh, I had a conversation with this gentleman. And, and, and he told me something that, that really made me feel really good about government. And you know, sometimes I don't always feel that way. Uh, I hate to hate to break that to anybody, but he said, I talked to him about this whole essential, non-essential thing. And in my mind, it should be safe, not safe. And ah, he, I love it. We have literally, I've used that with press uh, and that's exactly what we're using is that exact phrasing. Good. And, and this, exactly. this, this gentleman said to me, he said, you know, sir, he said, I think you more than anyone else uh, that there could be knows if your business is essential or non-essential. And it's, it's true. And it, to be called that, it's just kind of like a, and then see certain people that you don't really feel fit in that it's really a slap in the back, but we've got some questions. So the first one, I, I, I've got to throw it at you. So if you were governor, how would you bring the economy back online? That's an anonymous attendee who's asked that question. Sure. No, I, th I think the first thing is uh, we would set the criteria for what you have to do now. Um, you know, what I might do might be different than what, you know, Director Acton or the governor specifically says, but I think that, yeah, you know, there probably still aren't going to be large gatherings for a while. Uh, you're still going to have an expectation that masks as a customer or something is probably something you, you, you're still going to need for, for, for a little bit until we can start doing more of the testing, which we're still deficient in. Uh, and every place is going to have to have a plan for how you can maintain relatively close to the six distance, so six feet distance between customers or employees. Um, that's obviously, those are pretty simple principles. How they apply in individual cases is going to be, uh, perhaps some places can do it easily, some places can't do it easily. And I think that's clearly a challenge, but at least if you have that standard, and I think this is the key, is to have the health standard so that everybody knows what they need to do. And if you can do it, you do it. If you can't do it now, Maybe you don't open right away, but you have to move towards that. But once you hit that standard, you open. We don't do this, this thing where we're saying, you're a hospital, so you get to open. We're not saying that because you do food processing, you get to open. But if you do bridal, if you do, you know, things for bridal uh, weddings and stuff, you don't open. 
Well, Greg, who, who, who gets to look at that? I mean, who gets to come down to, let's say, uh, Hamilton County and, and look at, at, at a business? Who determines whether you're ready to go or not? Well, I think that what's going to happen is that some of this, by the way, in the CDC guidelines that the, the U.S. administration, Trump administration is talking about, and I think if you adhere to a lot of those guidelines, you're probably pretty close to where you need to be. And I think the answer is that you're not going to have every business being looked at before it opens. I, I don't know how you could uh, logistically do that. I do think that if somebody goes into somewhere and they see that there's an obvious problem, I, don't, I mean, we don't want snitches and stuff like that, but if there's a real thing and people aren't taking it seriously at some place, then perhaps the health inspector does go in on that basis and then examines it and says, it. just kind of like you have with restaurants anyway, you know, I mean, if, if a restaurant is known for having something bad happen or five people get sick because, you know, they're, they have E. coli based stuff and they haven't addressed the issue, somebody's going to say something in the department or the health inspector is going to come out and say, whoa, you're not keeping your food refrigerated appropriately, or you're not, you know, those kind of things. And that's how you catch some of that. And, you, and, and eventually you're going to have some random inspections mixed in there as well, spot checks. Um, but I think that's how you're going to have to do it. You can't do it on mass up front. You just need to have the standard and say, and if, you, if we spot check you and you don't have these things checked on your checklist, you better be right. Problem. Now, Anna asked a question, will a business be able to mandate that guests wear masks to be serviced? Or can a business just mandate that? Uh, I think so, sure. I think that, I think a business, ha I mean, if it's your business, you, well, first of all, I think actually that's probably something you're going to have to do as, as one of the checklist items anyway, probably, um, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, but I definitely think that a business should be able to do that because this is about, because you got to think that, that part of the issue we're going to have is um, there's a lot of employees out there that are going to be worried about going into, into work and they're going to need some visual cues that, 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 that they're going to be safe. And the same thing goes for some customers. Um, it part, you know, there's also that, that, there's that psychological element. I mean, people are, a lot of people are very nervous about this and uh, there's varying degrees of that. And, but if you're, if you're a senior citizen, you're going to be really worried about it. I'm an asthmatic. So I actually have a little bit more concern too. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how much I'm going to be going out even as we start opening things up. Right. So Tom asked the question, do you have any comment regarding the situation about whether the health director had the authority to lock down the state? Well, I think I, I, she did. Uh, the, the statutory authority is there. I don't think there's any question. In my opinion, uh, we did look at that. Um, I think there may be some interesting questions that the legislature asks about whether or not all of those authorities are appropriate or if there should be some time delimitation on some of those authorities or if there should be some sort of an oversight, a greater oversight role that perhaps the legislature might do. I mean, we, we see that with things like the controlling board, which has budgetary responsibilities or something called the Joint Committee on Agency Rule Review, where they overview executive agencies rule packages and they can... Uh, create a process for invalidating rules that they think go outside the scope of what the statute is. So you have these kind of uh, functions where the legislature has oversight over the executive branch in some key areas. We may want to create something like that, uh, that n not just to step on Director Atkins' toes, but just to make sure that there's a, a framework there that puts some guardrails on it. Um, and I think that that would probably, I'd be surprised if that conversation doesn't happen um, but as of right now, I think that the, the, she has a set, they're very broad statutory authority. I forget the, the section of the revised code, but there's a lot of broad authority that the director has under pandemic type. I think um, for our first pandemic, I think uh, it's kind of like your kid learning how to sleep in the bunk bed. Guardrails are a good thing. And I yeah. kind of feel like we need them right now because I don't have any idea what in the world is going on and, and, and really where this ends. So here's another question. As far as I know, this gentleman or uh, woman said, as far as I know, there are no state or county layoffs. So were they all essential and working? Doesn't seem like it was just, just looking for comments if this is a proper observation and what should be just and fair. Well, and I, and I think I mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, I think we're gonna have to look at things like furloughs. We're gonna have to look at what is the pay situation for both state and yes, local government employees. I think you're gonna have to look at some of those things. Um, no doubt about it. Now it's interesting, I saw and I don't know how broad based this is, but it was on a CNBC article today, I noticed, where Denise Driehaus, her credit commissioner down there, uh, said that she was taking a 10% pay cut. I don't, and that that was consistent with other employees. I don't know. I, I need to look at that and see what exactly they've done or not done on that. But, but she was specifically, it was like several states 
were the, the articles about state and local governments and how they're being impacted. And so there were several states mentioned and several local governments mentioned from other states, but she was mentioned specifically by name in the article. Two more questions. This is from Judy. How can we be sure the number of deaths are really from the virus? Many of us feel this is a deceptive way to control people. The number of the regular flu are higher than this virus. Who and how do we know what is truthful? Yeah, what, what, do, you, what do you look at? What do you look at? Well, and, and, and I'm gonna, it, it is difficult because, you know, it's called the novel coronavirus because it's new. And because it's new, um, it, we, don't, we don't exactly know all of the things. We keep finding out, I mean, you're hearing some stories. I remember reading stories about that the ventilators are bad for people because they actually have uh, symptoms that are more like air, altitude sickness and that there's problems with that. And then you hear about uh, some people have uh, all kinds of various other co-conditions that, that you're finding that seem to be related to it. And, the, and I think what you're finding is we haven't, we, we don't know yet. It's still, if you really think about it, we're less than six months into this. Uh, so we really just don't know enough of the information. So I think that the problem with a lot of the data is that they're scrambling. I, I think they don't know exactly what it is. I, I don't, I don't personally think that they're intentionally trying to be uh, malicious or, uh, or hiding the ball per se. I think it's that the fact that they don't know has given them the fear that they need to be so broad based with stuff. And I think that they're being broader than they would be if there was more knowledge. And this gets to the issue of, uh, which I think the great tragedy of this entire thing is there's a couple points. First of all, um, the Chinese lying was a big problem. That's <laughs> it's, it's the Communist Party, massive problem. I don't think uh, anybody can forget that that blame really lies at their doorstep for how this spread to other countries. But the but the thing here in America is we don't have enough testing. Um, that lack of testing is a core problem that really uh, has made this problem. Because as we're seeing some more data come out from California, and even today in New York, there were some numbers that seemed to indicate a lot more people have been exposed to this than we thought by tens of times, maybe even up to 50 times, which is remarkable. And if that's the case, then the death rate is way, way lower than we've been thing. told. Two, so quick, thing. two more well, things. Uh, somebody, Jay submitted a question. I read ORC 3701. It sounds in context like authority for limited local situations for shutting down. It is ambiguous, but may not allow shutting down the state economy. Is there any other state statute I should look at? Uh, you know what, let me, if, if the individual who asked that question wants to shoot an email, uh, my email is greg at buckeyeinstitute.org, and I'd encourage folks to, to shoot emails too, uh, because what I will do is, uh, let me ping my, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, I do, I, I used to stay at Holiday Inns until the shutdown, so I could, I could do that, so when I come down there and talk to you guys, uh, but, uh, no, uh, uh but I, I, I'll run that by and double check that, uh, I think that is a statute section, but I'd want to double check that and not misstate something. Last question before we, we um, do our closing. Here, here in, it's, this is from Dennis. Here in Hamilton County, Southwest Ohio, there's a massive 25 year sales tax increase. It's called oh. issue seven on yeah. the April ballot for bus and infrastructure. Wouldn't that affect the most least who are able to pay? Uh, tax increases, Matt, well, tax increases are always a pretty much bad thing. Uh, there's very rarely that I could ever, I, I'm not sure if I can think of, a scenario where a tax increase is a, is a good thing. Um, this would be one of the worst absolute times for something like that to happen. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's just, I mean, it's, it's terrible timing uh, uh, for this to happen and it will be terrible timing uh, for the rest of this year and probably going into next year too. I mean, again, it's always going to be bad, but I think we have, we are only just now beginning to wrestle with the magnitude of this and, and Ohio is not, because of some of, of a lot of structural issues at the local government level and a variety of other things, we, we really didn't prepare ourselves for a recession. We certainly didn't prepare ourselves for, you know, whatever this is going to turn out to be, which is clearly significantly worse uh, than a recession. And uh, tax increases when people are just struggling uh, like this uh, is the worst possible time to, to do something like that. And uh, I didn't even get a chance to ask you about the election, uh, but we'll have to save that for another time, Greg. I'm just so appreciative of, um, of you joining us tonight. I'm appreciative that you've been such a good friend uh, 
to empower you and you've, you've joined us on, on, on so many occasions. So Greg Lawson, thank you so much for visiting empower you tonight. Have a good night and thank you. Well, thank you so much. And Hey, look, I, I look forward to your next, uh, your next round of, uh, of uh, your next semester. Uh, we'll have a lot more to talk about and hopefully we'll have more information to know where we're kind of trending at that point too. We will have a lot to talk about for sure. So, um, so everyone, I wanted to close tonight, give you a little something to be uh, a little bit more positive about than what we talked about tonight. So this is a story I wanted to share with you tonight about a very empowered, fighting 77-year-old woman. So many hospitals like St. Michael's Medical Center in Newark, New Jersey are drawing inspiration from the beloved Rocky movies as a means of empowering their patients who have recovered from COVID-19. After all, I'm sure every single listener out there for Empower You is just like me, and you would agree that Rocky One is without a doubt the greatest movie ever made. So it's cool what they do. Whenever a patient has been successfully treated for coronavirus and has been declared ready to leave the hospital, the workers have begun calling for a code Rocky over the hospital's speaker system. All available staffers at that point gather together in the hospital hallways in order to offer a rousing round of applause to that patient as they're wheeled out of the building. So tonight, I say to all the hospital workers out there, to all you first responders, to all the fighters out there like Constance, I just gotta say, yo Constance, you did it. <laughs>